Hey guys, Grumpy here with another tier list. So at the end of the previous Let's Play, I decided to make a tier list for all of the ships in the game. Um, this time I'm doing character skills, so we're capping off the Fast Five Let's Play with these uh, character skills. Um, I'm going to rank them... So these are all the, the perks in the game. I'm going to rank them as if the character themselves are taking these skills. I know a lot of these skills also apply to officers. Um, when we get to those skills, I'll uh, I'll uh, discuss that. But ultimately, the thing that's going to be the deciding factor of where the skill ends up will be as if the character is selecting that skill. So, uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into this. Uh, starting off with Helmsmanship. Helmsmanship is a very nice perk. I'm going to go ahead and put it in A tier. Uh, gives you top speed and maneuverability. Um, the elite version also gives you the zero flux boost, which is really nice if your ship doesn't have safety overrides. Uh, the zero flux boost being a plus 50 to top speed when you're not generating flux, or well, when you have zero flux. Elite helmsmanship, what it does is it uh, gives you the plus 50 top speed so long as you're not generating flux. So if you're not firing your weapons, if you don't have your shields up, you will get a plus 50 to your top speed. Um, so really nice if you're closing the distance or trying to break contact, um, this will usually get you out of a jam. Next up we have Combat Endurance. I'm going to go ahead and put that in S tier. Uh, Combat Endurance gives you plus 60 seconds of peak performance time, and then it also gives you 15% combat readiness. Combat readiness is such, such an important skill on the battlefield. Um, you want to do your best to maximize combat readiness. Uh, combat readiness gives you perks in combat like um, increased range, faster top speed, less damage taken, um, less chance of malfunctions, just a whole suite of, of um, benefits that you really want to, to maximize. Next up we have impact mitigation and damage control. Uh, I do not like these perks. I'm going to put them in D tier, um, possibly F tier. The reason being for these two perks is they protect your armor and your hull. Um, impact mitigation protects your armor and damage control protects your hull. Uh, once you start taking dam- like, okay, so typically the things that do damage to you are going to be missiles. Um, and those are missiles that you either can't block or you're overloaded and they strike you anyway. Taking less damage on a missile doesn't really matter. Um, your hull, your armor is probably going to get damaged anyway to the point where your hull is exposed. Um, I'm talking about for like things like harpoons, which the enemy loves to bring to combat. Um, against pathers, you're going to face a lot of hammers. Um, you're going to face a lot of reapers if you go against like uh, some of the larger factions. Having a bit of armor damage reduction or hull damage reduction isn't really going to make a difference. Uh, those missiles are going to tear you apart. So for that reason, I'd never take these perks. Um, also, you have to compare that to other perks in the game that you would have to forego if you do take these. And most other perks in the game are going to be better than these two. Uh, that said, for officers, because officers can't, oh, well, let me back up. Uh, you should give your officers helmsmanship if you can. It's not really necessary. I would strongly recommend giving your officers combat endurance. Um, very, very, very strongly recommend giving them combat endurance. It's usually a snap pick over any other choice. And then I would just avoid these two. Don't give your officers these. Even if you're going for, like, high armor ships, like onslaughts or dominators, whatever, I still wouldn't take impact mitigation. Um, it's not really going to make a difference. Alright. Next up though, uh, the other defensive skill in combat is field modulation. And oh boy is this skill busted. Um, it has everything going for it. It only costs one skill point in that it is a tier 1 skill. You don't need to invest heavily into combat to get it. It gives you better shields. Um, shields, unlike hull and armor, are infinite. They can't absorb an infinite amount of damage all at once, but they can absorb a, an amount of damage up to their capacity. 
and then vent that damage away and then do it all over again. And in theory, if you had an infinite amount of uh, peak performance time, you would be able to absorb an infinite amount of damage. Whereas your armor and your hull can only sustain so much damage before your ship is destroyed. So, field modulation, and especially elite field modulation, which is worth getting on your officers, uh, is really, 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 like, unbelievably beneficial. I can't stress how beneficial this skill is. Uh, definitely worth uh, the S tier position. Um, elite field modulation, by the way, giving you the plus, uh, allowing you to vent 15% of your flux while your shields are, are active. Hard flux while your shields are active. Um, so we already know how good that is on the monitor. Giving that to all your ships is a uh, is just a, an incredible uh, benefit on the battlefield. Next up, we have point defense. Uh, I'm gonna put this in C tier, and a lot of you aren't gonna like it. Uh, what this does is it gives you more damage to missiles and fighters in its base form, and then I think the elite version gives you an additional 200 range on your point defense. I don't use point defense at all, um, like at all at all. Um, my monitor does all the screening for me. My monitors are the one um, screening fighters, they screen missiles, they hold capital ships attention, they basically they help me control the battlefield. Um, and for that reason, I don't put point defense on any of my ships, so I never get any benefit um, out of this perk. That said, I do recognize the benefit of it. Um, if you are someone that likes to use point defense, um, having additional damage to missiles and fighters does make sense. Um, it's a nice to have. Uh, you can put this on your officers. I wouldn't recommend taking it yourself. Um, you shouldn't dedicate yourself to point defense support. You should leave that to your other ships. But um, yeah, it does have its benefits. I just don't use it, um, so I don't see the point of it. Uh, here we have a skill that I don't recognize immediately. Oh, this is target analysis. S tier perk. Uh, a tier perk. A, a to S tier. Uh, it depends. Um, target analysis is just flat damage. Um, it gives you, I think, 10% to destroyers, 15% to cap cruisers, and 20% to capital ships. Um, actually, you know what? Yeah, I'll put it in S tier. Um, I believe it also applies to missiles, which is why I'm putting it in S tier. If it doesn't apply to missiles, then it's probably an A tier perk. But um, just being able to do 20% additional damage to a capital ship, while you have very damaging weapons like um, Hellbores, um, maybe you're using Gosses for kinetic damage, um, like the really big hitters, having this on top of those big hitters just makes you do a ton more damage. Um, if it does affect missiles, which I assume it would, uh, your Reapers go from doing 4,000 uh, damage to a target to 40, if you hit a capital ship, to 4,800 damage to that capital ship, which is huge. Um, and again, it only costs one uh, skill point. I think it's worth it. Um, normally, I don't really take combat skills, but of these three, I would be more than willing to take one. Next up, we have Ballistic Mastery. A bit of a niche skill. Yeah, niche skill. I'm going to put it in B tier. Um, it adds additional damage and range to your ballistics, which is really nice, uh, especially for smaller ballistics. It just gives them that much more reach. And small ballistics are usually very flux efficient weapons. So giving them the range and support that they need um, just makes your ships more effective overall. Um, the elite version gives you, I think, ballistic speed, which I don't, I don't know if that stat matters. Like, I mean, uh, unless you're using something slow firing like Hellbores or uh, Gosses, like, like a slow firing ballistic weapon or heavy Maulers. No, even those are quick. I don't know. Like, I've never had a target miss because the projectile was too slow like i've had my ships miss because they were like flamed out and turning in the wrong direction or they were targeting like a frigate or something like really small and fast or like a fighter but 
I don't know, like, usually I'm not using large weapons against fast moving targets anyway, so I don't ever really need Ballistic Mastery. So for that reason, it's good, it gives you a little bit of damage and range to Ballistics, but otherwise it's really only good on Ballistic ships, um, and it's a little niche. Oh boy, Systems Expertise. I want to love this skill because it wants to be so good, but for the investment it takes, you need, I believe you need four tier one skills and then a fifth skill point to get this. And for what it does, it's just not enough. Uh, unfortunately, this is gonna be our first F tier skill. Uh, Systems Expertise, what it does is it gives you an additional charge on your, um, on your skills. It gives you reduced cooldown. Um, it gives you, I think, more uptime, something like that. Um, it just basically makes your special ability better. The thing is, though, it only applies to your ship, and usually your special ability doesn't matter. Like, um, let's say, like, even on the LP Brawler, which I pilot all the time, I, I main the LP Brawler, um... If I had faster accelerated ammo feeder, it wouldn't make a difference. The performance of my ship would still be the same. Um, I would still use it in close quarters combat, and I still would be able to destroy most ships in the game. Um, having a faster accelerated ammo feeder wouldn't change things. Um, there's plenty enough time already going from ship to ship that usually I have accelerated ammo feed for every engagement, and if I need it, and I don't have it up, I would just back away from whatever my target is and then wait until it's ready. Um, yeah, it, I don't know. Uh, this skill is definitely not worth five skill points to invest in, and it just doesn't do enough. Um, I don't know. If you guys have a, a different idea of how you use systems expertise, like maybe I'm missing a ship. Or a special ability that's like you know game breaking where you want this let me know but still it's just way too much of an investment for not enough in my opinion um special abilities don't really turn this out of battle they just are usually win wars um or they help you maintain parity but they're not like win on their um they're not gonna win you the fight on your on your own that's what i'm trying to say uh, that said, we have Missile Specialization. Um, it is it is an S tier perk for what it does. It doubles your missiles, which is absurdly powerful. Missiles are um, one of the strongest tools in the game. Uh, missiles, on the other hand, unlike weapon, unlike uh, ship systems, missiles will turn the tide of battle. A well-timed, um, precise strike from missiles will destroy a large enemy vessel, which will um, cascade the battle in your favor or if it happens to you will cause your your uh, fleet to capitulate um so this is an s tier perk the reason it's an a though and not s tier is because it requires a lot of investment to get um and unfortunately if you invest all the way to the point where you get missile specialization that means you have to forego a lot of these other capstone abilities so Neuralink, automated ships uh best of the best support doctrine derelict hulls and hull restoration or derelict operations hull restoration i think is the name of these two um you can only have uh up to i believe you can only have up to three capstones just because you only get 15 skill point levels in vanilla and by taking missile specialization uh, that's one of your capstones. You can only have up to two others. So I'm going to put it in A tier, but it does deserve to be an S tier. It's just too much of an investment. For an officer, though, if you see missile, missile specialization, take it over any other skill. Um, even if your officer is in a smaller craft, doesn't have a lot of missiles, doesn't have important missiles, take it, and when you get upgrade to bigger ships, um, you are going to be so thankful that you picked up this this uh, perk. All right, so moving into leadership. Now that we're done with combat, um, here we have. I think this is ground operations. 
Mm. I think this is ground operations. Uh, what it does is it gives you, I think, a small bit of weapon damage, and it increases the effectiveness of your um, of your marines. I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in C tier. Um, I don't do a lot of raiding, and honestly, raiding is such a such an odd mechanic in the game. Um, you don't ever really have to do it. Like when I did my when I did my zero to hero, I don't think I raided unless I was doing uh like mission. Yeah, unless I was doing like the you know extract the target mission. I don't think I ever raided like for supplies or blueprints or anything like that. And then also in the uh, Fast Five series, I didn't raid at all. Um, so it was like, I'm, I'm actually going to move this down to D tier now that I think about it. Um, I don't know if you ever need this skill. The 5% weapon damage that I, I think it gives is okay, but that's pretty negligible as well. Uh, next up we have coordinated maneuvers. Uh, coordinated maneuvers I'm going to put in B tier. Um, it adds a little, uh, actually I'm going to move it up to A tier. It adds some movement speed to your entire fleet in the form of uh, nav rating. So nav rating is a, uh, I believe it's a percent bonus to the top speed of all the ships that you deploy. Um, so if you can stack a lot of nav rating, it's really good. I like to put it on frigates that have too much OP and not much to do with it. Um, like omens are really good ships to put nav rating on because um, they're not really doing much else. Uh, but the the reason it's an A tier is because it gives you um, combat point recovery based on the number of frigates and destroyers. Uh, command point recovery based on the number of frigates and destroyers that you uh, deploy. I use a lot of frigates in the form of monitors, so I get my money's worth out of this perk. Um, that's why I recommend it. <laughs> Next up, we have the man, the myth, the meme. Wolfpack Tactics. Very, like, the definition of a niche skill. B tier, C tier. I'm gonna put it in C tier. Uh, it adds bonus damage if you use frigates and destroyers. You get more damage for frigates. Um, it gets anything that are larger than it. So frigates get dam bonus damage towards destroyers, cruisers, and capitals. Destroyers get bonus damage to uh, cruises and capitals. Uh, I mean, I guess you can take this skill if you plan on running a mostly frigate free fleet with a destroyer flagship. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, it tends to fall apart once you go against like serious threats, so large pirate armadas large uh, path armadas um any kind of probably like 200k bounty 200k plus bounty uh, is probably going to squash your your fleet unless you're running all hyperions omens and monitors and you have like a really specialized you know frigate fleet um even then I, well yeah, if you're doing that, then sure, take Wolfpack Tactics. But if you're not building specifically for it, or if you're not experienced in the game, I would would not recommend it. Uh, just just skip this skill. Next up, we have crew training. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in S tier. I'm actually gonna put that at the top of S tier. Crew training just gives all of your ships a blanket 15% combat readiness, no questions asked. Uh, I mentioned this before, but combat readiness is so, 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 so important. Um, wherever you can, you should be looking to maximize your combat readiness. Um, in addition to all the benefits that I mentioned before, so increased accuracy, range, um, less damage taken, more damage dealt. Uh, it also affects how sharply your bonuses are how long you have after your peak performance time runs out before your ship becomes unusable um so you do have peak performance time which is like a buffer that gets eight before it affects your combat readiness 
And then once your combat readiness starts to go, if you have 100% combat readiness, then you get an additional like 100 seconds. I think it's one combat readiness per second. So you get an additional 100 seconds versus having um, like 50% combat readiness and having only uh, having less than a minute to wrap up the fight. So uh, giving your ships 15% CR is, is just really nice. Next up we have Carrier Group. Uh, carrier Group affects the replacement rate for your fighter bays. I'm going to put that in C tier. Uh, it's good, but um, it only affects 8 bays I believe. So once you exceed 8 fighter bays for your fleet, you start getting less effect uh, of this skill. Um, replacement rate is, how do I explain it? Um, say you have a carrier with a pod of, of claws, let's say claws. Uh, there are five claws in, in that strike group. Um, if you have 100%, uh, replenishment rate, then you have all five of your claws. As you lose your claws in combat, your replenishment rate or your, uh, I forget exactly what it's called. Something. It, your, your, I think it's called reinforcement. Your reinforcement rate goes down from starting from 100, going all the way down to zero if you lose all of your ships. Um, if you regroup your ships, so if you press the Z key uh, to tell your fighters to come back, your reinforcement rate is going to slowly tick up. Once it goes from 0 to 20%, you get your first fighter back. When it goes from 20 to 40%, you get your second fighter back, and so on and so forth. Uh, what carry group is going to do is it's going to increase that rate at which your ships recover. Um, so it is nice there if you have slower ships to recover like Thunders or I believe Gladius as well. Xyphos also have a long recovery time. Uh, so it's really nice there. But if you're using standard fighters like Broadswords, Claws, Wasps, whatever, Talons, then you don't need this. Um, it's not really going to be worth it. So again, it's very niche. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. Let's do that. All right, and then we have fighter uplink. Fighter uplink is okay as well. It just affects the speed of your fighters and the. It's something else, and I think it reduces the losses that you take. Uh, it's okay. I, it's good, it's really good for bombers, because your bombers get to their target faster, deploy their missiles, and then come back. Um, so it is nice there, but, again, I, I rarely use this. Uh, next up we have, ooh, I forget the name of the skill. I believe this is Officer Training? So this is officer training, I believe. Uh, this is the skill that gives you um, one additional level to all your officers, and then also uh, one elite skill, one additional elite skill for your officers. Um, it also gives you uh, two command points, one or two command points. I believe it's two. Uh, I'm gonna put this in C tier. Uh, no, I'm gonna put it in B tier. It's okay. Um, I'm going to talk about officer, I'm going to talk about these two together, officer training and, and, wait, no, officer training, officer management. Um, I'm going to talk about these two in conjunction. Officer management gives you two additional officers. Um, having more officers is going to be a lot better than having your officers just be a little better, right? Um... Your officers having one skill won't really make as big of an impact as having two more officers in, like, in other cruisers. Maybe in a um, highly specialized frigate, like a monitor or an omen. Um, like, having your officers in specialized ships allows for, like, more more control of the battlefields also your officers you can fine-tune their behavior to get a really specific uh, 
behavior out of a ship so you can maximize the most of it and build around that officer um you can take different weapon systems that you wouldn't use otherwise so just having more officers is going to be better than having um fewer but better officers in my opinion so that's why i put that in s tier next will be a best of the best i'm gonna put this in b tier um it allows you to build in the third s mod to your ships i don't I don't really see the point in that. Most of my ships don't even have S mods built in. Um, if they do, it's usually just one. And then maybe on my ship, I might build in two. Uh, I've never seen a point in, you know, triple S modding my entire fleet. One, that costs a ton of story points. Um, and two, it, it doesn't make your ships that much better. It, uh, it does. Um, but like on cruisers and capitals, you already have so much ordnance point to play with that usually you can just find a way to fit in that skill, um, or just forego it and then still build a pretty decent ship without it. So, um, this requires a lot of investment. Best of the best is a capstone ability. Um, and if you take it, that means you have to forego other capstone abilities. So I wouldn't recommend that one. Instead, what I would take is Support Doctrine. Support Doctrine is so incredibly, like, I'm gonna put that here. It is so incredibly bustedly powerful. Uh, what Support Doctrine allows you to do, or what it does is it gives you combat endurance, impact mitigation, and helmsmanship for all of your unpiloted ships. So, if you have, let's say, five officers and a fleet of 20 ships, that means 15 of your ships are getting three perks each for free. So if you take one skill, you're giving 45 skills worth of points to the rest of your fleet. That is, that is totally busted. Um, and they're good skills, right? Helmsmanship we already talked about and, and combat endurance we talked about. Um, both very powerful skills. Impact mitigation is lackluster. Don't really care about that one. But the other two are just insane. And you get to give it to every ship that's not piloted by an officer. The downside though is if you want combat endurance on your ships with officers, you kind of have to take it um, when it comes up for your officers. So it turns combat endurance into a must take um, in order for your ships, uh, in order for your piloted ships to keep up with your unpiloted ones. But, um, would strongly recommend support doctrine i take this every time usually i rush it usually i go all leadership just so i can get support doctrine and, and go from there um blah, 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 blah. next up we have navigation put that in s tier uh navigation gives you the transverse jump ability right from the beginning of the game um usually it's the first perk that i take um unless i skip the storyline and unlock it from the start uh, it also gives you plus one burn speed to your fleet, and then if you sustain burn, it gives you plus two. So usually you can hit that plus 20 cap really easily. Um, would strongly recommend it, it's a really good perk. Um, you really, really want to be around 20 burn speed so that you can either close the distance with fleets that you want to fight or avoid the, the fleets that you don't want to. Next up we have sensors, which is the counterpoint to navigation sensors is a tier actually uh, yes yeah, sense sensors is a tier possibly b tier uh, sensors allows you to move through hyperspace a little faster um you get plus three burn speed i believe to move through the clouds so it's uh, nice to have um but usually what most people do is just hold down shift anyway and they don't really care about how long it takes. Uh, they just speed through the clouds like that. Um, it also increases your sensor range and decreases your profile, which is really nice if you're doing any kind of stealth or if you're looking to raid convoys in space, which is what I use it for. Um, it helps me spot those juicy uh, merchant convoys that are flying by at the uh, edge of my sensor range that I would normally miss. All right, next up we have gunnery implants. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in B tier. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in high B tier. I'll I'll put it above ballistic mastery. 
Uh, I'd give Gunnery Implants a B because it only affects your ship, um, but it is powerful. Uh, it gives you increased range, increased auto fire accuracy. Uh, auto fire accuracy is the accuracy of your weapons that are on a different channel than you're currently on. So if you have um, on the brawler, let's say, I have my assault chain guns on channel one, and I have my sabos on channel two. If I sit on channel two, I guess that's a bad example because the the turrets are hard points on the brawler. Okay, imagine if they weren't hard points. Imagine if they could rotate in an arc. If I sit on channel two with my sabo missiles and my uh, assault chain guns are auto fire, they're gonna have increased accuracy versus if I was on channel one manually controlling them, um, they won't track the enemy as efficiently. So it is nice. Um, the increased range is really nice because it affects both ballistic and energy weapons. So it's a lot more flexible than let's say ballistic mastery. So you can use it on a lot more ships. Um, so not really niche. Uh, and okay, uh, you can stack this with like integrated targeting unit, dedicated targeting core from the very start of the game. Uh, advanced optics it also stacks really nice with. Um, so you can get some really ridiculous ranges. Next up we have energy weapon mastery. Uh, this is a niche ability, but it is a powerful one. Um, what Energy Weapon Mastery allows you to do is uh, you can build a ship like the Apogee, which was a ton of fun to build, that focuses on short range, high damaging energy weapons. So things like antimatter blasters, plasma cannons. Um, even the auto pulse cannon to a certain extent, each blast doesn't do that much damage, but if you can unleash a full um, round of blast from an auto pulse cannon, that will add up. Uh, it makes the tachyon lance deadlier, it makes the heavy blaster even deadlier, right? Um, so you really just want to focus on a, uh, a ship that has a ton of uh, high damaging energy weapons and just making the most of your flux i the way i built it was a short range ship with safety overrides so on the apogee i'm um, just focusing on short range weapons and using a plasma cannon to uh do enough damage to opponent's shields and then eventually erode them and then start using uh, the high flux that i built up while i was trying to peel away their shields to impart as much damage to the armor as possible I'm also putting in B tier because it mirrors Ballistic Mastery, so you're welcome for that. Uh, next up, we have Electronic Warfare. Uh, it's a good, it's a good ability. Um, it does require a lot of investment in technology to get. It gives you ECM rating. ECM rating is. Uh, it is important to to get. Usually you get ECM rating through having more officers than the enemy and just having a bigger fleet overall. And what ECM rating does is it increases your range or reduces your opponent's range. Um, it's on a sliding scale. So the more ECM you have, uh, the bigger the effect is gonna be. The more ECM rating that you have over your opponent, the, the larger the effect. Um, so this is a nice skill to have if you have like a smaller fleet and want to be on parity with other fleets or if you want to put the nail in the coffin then uh, you can take ECM rating and just go completely uh, dominance mode and just outrange your opponent every single time. Um, really good if you have a fleet that's already stacking range. So if you use a lot of long range weapons, you have a lot of uh, cautious or steady officers. Um, integrated targeting unit ballistic mastery gunnery mastery the whole works this is a very 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 nice skill to to stack on top of that uh then we have flux regulation that is a s tier perk it is fleet wide it affects every ship in your fleet regardless it allows you to add an additional five capacitors and five vents to your ships and it also increases the effectiveness of your vents and capacitors i take this usually every time i feel like it's a must-have um, right up there with actually I'll put that above crew training um, I feel like it's a must-have usually most of the time uh, would strongly recommend that skill 
again flux and flux management are yeah flux management is is key to uh becoming successful in battle all right then we have uh flux coil tuning no no no, no, no. phase coil tuning uh this was flux regulation phase coil tuning is niche hmm. i'm gonna put it in the a tier though it is extremely niche um i probably put it under yeah these two uh these four um it is a must take if you plan on running any phase ships in your fleet well not any if you plan on either flagshipping a phase ship or you plan on incorporating more than i'd say four phase ships uh it is a must take it gives you two powerful hull mods that being adaptive phase coil which allows you to move faster while you're in phase space it also reduces the phase uh, the speed penalty that you endure while you're in phase space um, and phase anchor which um, increases the or decreases the cooldown between weapons um, while you're in phase space two very very powerful abilities um, phase anchor probably being the stronger of the two uh, but this gives you it for free which otherwise those are very rare mods to come across um, this just gives you it no questions asked and then on top of that it gives you some nice perks to your your face ships uh, it reduces the penalty that they take overall to being in face space I think it also reduces the amount of flux they generate while they're in face space um, some nice to haves I can't remember exactly what it does oh it also gives you peak performance time for all your face ships so you don't have to deal with that crushing um, you know 30 second window that you get on some phase ships if you had safety overrides so uh really nice to have would definitely recommend it if you're running um, any kind of serious phase fleet then we have cybernetic augmentations i believe is the name of the skill this gives your officers two additional elite skills uh I never take this I, again making your officers better is way less important than just having more officers um, you can take this skill there's nothing really wrong with it but I've I don't know I haven't noticed um, a difference between like the elite version of a lot of skills don't really bring enough to the battle that uh, it would make a difference if my officer had more elite skills you know you can take it feel free to take it i usually don't um uh, so i i don't recommend that skill <laughs> then we have probably the worst skill in the game um i'm gonna put it here neural link i do not know what this skill is for i don't understand its purpose I don't understand its utility I know what it's supposed to do uh, it's supposed to make um, it's supposed to make you able to pilot two ships um, you can ping pong back and forth between the two ships you know in theory you could pilot a uh, you could do like a hammer and anvil yourself so you have the hammer uh, you have the anvil which is like your tankier ship and then you have the hammer which is your DPS ship and you could pilot the hammer behind whatever your target is and you know work a ship down like that I no <laughs> uh, no star sector isn't designed for that you're much better off just having focusing on one ship um, in theory you could also use Neuralink to pilot a secondary ship as like a backup so in case the ship you're in blows up you have another ship that you can jump over to but no there, this no <laughs> there's no point yeah um you can also do some funky things where you uh, neural link into a redacted ship but who cares um usually your redacted ship is strong enough that it doesn't need to be piloted by yourself um i usually i like i've never considered piloting a, a redacted ship i just let it fly and do its own thing so 
and this is a capstone ability it requires so much to get Neuralink and it's just never worth it in my opinion um, don't take this skill take it if you want to experiment and do something wacky if you have a, a Neuralink build that works go ahead and drop it in the comments but me I've no I've never found a use for this skill I'd, I'd never take it then we have the other capstone ability for technology which is automated ships um, this is a tricky one to place it allows you a new axis of the game I'm trying to figure out where it is you know I'm gonna put it in S tier uh, it's not a must take so it doesn't really belong here but um, it allows you a new access to star sector which is really cool and I think it's deserving of the S tier rank what it allows you to do is recover um, automated drone ships so slight spoilers i mean anyone who's watched my series now probably knows about this or anyone who's played the game knows about this but uh you can recover remnant ships using automated ships you could also recover derelict ships using automated ship um it's just it's it's interesting right because you can replace a good bulk of your fleet with remnant ships or derelict ships if you wanted to and uh, just let that be your fleet and go completely like role-playing and just you know run around the map as a remnant ordo or as a junkyard fleet if you go with all derelicts and I think that's really cool um, it does something that no other perk in the game does and it really just opens up the floor to some interesting ideas um, I put it to good use in my uh, in my fast five series so you can watch that and um see what what you can do with this skill so really nice there i'm gonna i'm actually gonna put it up push it higher uh not that high i, I would still recommend all of these skills above automated ships if you haven't tried it definitely pick it up uh give it a try see if you enjoy it and now finally we move on to uh industry so industry is the money making skill um usually it will save you a couple of credits here or there or it'll be your path to prosperity um really nice overall to take so we have bulk transportation which i'm gonna put in high b tier uh it's not necessary by any means if you're playing a normal campaign so if you're incorporating uh frigates or not frigates freighters into your fleet um so things like atlases the phaeton um the buffalo at any stage uh anything like that you're going to have enough cargo capacity most of the time or cargo fuel personnel capacity most of the time that you don't need it oh actually i'm gonna move it up to a tier sorry i forgot about the secondary ability of bulk transport i'm gonna move it to to high a actually um, usually you don't need the initial benefit of bulk transport, which increases the amount of capacity that your fleet has. Um, but if you're not running any kind of freighters, like I had to do for fast five, uh, bulk transport was a godsend. I really wish I took this skill earlier. It would have saved me a lot of headache, but, um, when I did take it, it was such a relief. The second ability of bulk transport, and the reason why it's an A tier, um, not B tier, is because it adds plus two burn speed to all civilian ships in your fleet um the non-militarized one so if you put militarized subsystem on a on a civilian ship it no longer gets the bulk transport bonus but adding plus two speed to your freighters is massive um the atlas i think has a base speed of seven so it brings it from seven to nine um the phaeton i think is already at eight so that one doesn't really matter uh but things like your salvage rigs your ventures um all those ships i think the mule and gemini are considered civilian ships um so if you're running those like pseudo combat ships that have slower uh slower burn speeds uh you can still maintain a fast uh 20 burn speed fleet if you take bulk transport so for that reason i definitely recommend it mostly for atlases uh, make sure atlas fast enough uh, without any investment without having to build an aug drive field to make it a plus 20 or to make your fleet uh, maintain that 20 speed then we have 
salvaging. I'm going to put that in S tier. I'm going to put that in high S tier. Uh, the reason I put it in high S tier is because it affects the amount of goods you get from um, convoy raiding, which is what I do. Um, you're going to get more supplies, you're going to get more heavy armaments, more fuel. Um, actually, I don't know if it affects fuel. But you're just going to get more supplies, more you know, luxury goods, whatever, volatiles. Whatever your, the convoy had, you could get more of it. So I would recommend it. Also, it reduces the survey cost. I believe it reduces the survey cost of um, salvaging in space and surveying a planet. So uh, definitely S tier. <laughs> then we have field repairs. Uh, field repairs is another good skill. I'm going to put it in lower A tier. I, I'm going to put it in, in mid A tier. Uh, what field repairs does is it restores your ship's uh, hull and armor for free. After combat, uh, I think up to 25% of the damage you take. Um, it's just really nice in saving you supplies in the long run. I fight constantly and I recover ships all the time. That's how I get most of my ships. Um, not having to worry about, you know, killing my fleet supplies heading back home is just so much of a, a um, so much of a convenience. Um, so I would I would strongly recommend field repairs if you tend to fight a lot like I do. Then we have um, ordnance expertise. This is a S tier perk. Um, where are we putting this? Oh, actually no, it's an it is an eight it, it's an S tier perk for officers, um, but it is a A tier perk. Um, for you because it only affects your ship which is unfortunate but for what it does it does do a lot uh, ordinance expertise by the base version gives you plus two to your events for every point you spend on ordinance so if you spend 10 points on ordinance you get an additional 20 events um, if you spend 200 points on ordinance you're gonna get um, Sorry, if you spend 100 points on ordinance, you're going to get an additional 200 vents. This is scaled up by things like flux regulation and also safety overrides. So you can extend its um, efficacy uh, that way. And then on top of that, um, the elite version of ordinance expertise gives you capacity. Uh, I think it gives you 200 capacity for every point you spend on ordinance. So if you slap this on like a capital ship, like a Paragon, well not really a Paragon, but on something like an Onslaught, um, on a Dominator, things with like a lot of armament slots, you're going to get a, a ton of bang, bang for your buck. Um, so I would definitely recommend this. It is a, usually it's a snap uh, decision to take it if I see it come up um, as one of the officer choices. I usually always take ordnance expertise on my officers. Then we have polarized armor. Uh, polarized armor is it's it's good. Um, it's a little better than damage or uh, not damage control, impact mitigation. They both do a similar thing. They reduce the amount of damage your armor takes, but polarized armor does it better. Uh, it just reduces the 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 incoming number um so normally your armor blocks i think like 85 percent of damage you take something like that uh what polar's armor does is it bumps that up to 90 um, which is a massive jump five percent doesn't sound like much but if you play a game like path of exile you know what the difference between having 75 max res and having 80 max res is um taking five percent less damage uh, taking 5% less damage to your armor or having your armor be 5% more effective is is a bigger deal than taking 25% less damage um, to your armor so polar's armor is good but even still it's very niche um, just don't get hit forehead and then you don't have to worry about your armor at all uh, I would recommend taking it but you can if you want if if it's on your officers, 
I usually skip officers that have polarized armor just because I feel like it's a wasted skill on the officer. But take it, try it out. I don't know if you're doing weird shield shunt stuff, stacking armor, then go for it. Uh, next up, we have. One is containment procedures, and the other one is makeshift equipment. I think this is containment procedures, which affects your fuel consumption. I'm going to put that in low B tier. Uh, fuel is a little bit of a problem in the, um, from the, well, fuel is a huge problem in the early game going all the way up to the middle game. And then it hits a critical point where it becomes a really big problem when, once you start toting around capital ships and a lot of cruisers. Uh, fuel is sometimes hard to come by. It's not usually in plentiful supply at the at the amount that you burn and, and how much you need. Uh, you're usually burning hundreds of fuel a day to move your fleet around. Um, so containment procedures definitely helps there. Uh, you just spend less fuel overall. Your ships become more fuel efficient. Um, you can go farther. You can store more fuel. Uh, you get more fuel from combat, which is really nice. That stacks with salvaging. I believe that sucks with salvaging. Um, so, you know, really nice there. You never have to worry about fuel again. But then, uh, this is a slight spoiler again. Once you complete the main storyline, you get access to gates. And uh, gates allow you to teleport around the uh, Persian sector without burning that much fuel. So, at that point, this perk becomes pretty much useless. Uh, then I wouldn't recommend it. You're just gonna have too much fuel. You could sell your fuel, but even then fuel doesn't really uh, sell for much. Then we have containment procedures. I'm gonna put that in high A tier. Uh, containment procedure, actually, you know what? I'm gonna put it in S tier. Uh, containment procedures cuts your supply cost in half. Usually supply is a much bigger problem than fuel. Fuel you only burn in hyperspace. Supplies you burn every single day. Um, regardless and then also post combat you it takes a lot of supply to bring your ships back to um, being at 100% combat readiness not 100% but you know their max combat readiness uh, usually takes a lot of supplies so for that reason I would definitely recommend makeshift equipment um, nothing wrong with containment procedures I just recommend makeshift equipment more uh, I would take crew training I would take I would I would I'd put it here before impact mitigation or before target analysis but after combat endurance take these skills first then we have industry planning uh, S tier perk it adds plus one supplies to all of your colonies um, or sorry to the colonies that you govern so um, in 0.95.1a uh, RC6, you can only govern up to two colonies without facing penalties. Um, so, you're potentially, if you govern some like really eclectic planets with a lot of different supplies, you're potentially looking at, um, you know, adding eight to nine additional commodities to your planet, or yeah, to your production, which is really nice. Um, that's a few. Uh, hundred thousand credits per month not hundreds but like a hundred thousand credits per month and i think that's worth it um for one skill <sighs> then we have i think this is called hull restoration i'm not sure but what it does is it cures s mods for your ships and you guys are not gonna like this i already know i'm gonna put this in d in c tier I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in D tier. Um, high D though, high D. I, I put a little respect on the same. What Hall Restoration allows you to do is it allows you to remove D mods from your ships um, for free. That's the main thing it does. It also reduces the amount of D mods that ships start with when you recover them from combat. This. In my opinion, is is such a non-issue. Um, a lot of people rush for this to get it early so that they can, you know, restore the the D mods on their capital ships, um, or not their capital ships, but on the ships that they acquire 
um, so that they have like a perfect pristine fleet. But honestly, having a couple demods is nice because it reduces the supply costs that your ships have, and it doesn't really affect them that much in combat. Um, so it's okay to have a couple demods. Um, after that, and then on top of that, like restoring demods only costs credits, and credits are relatively easy to come by. So I don't mind removing demods if I have to. The demods I consider like absolutely detrimental are things that affect your shields, um, things that affect your fleet's burn speed, so degraded drive field, or things that affect your. Um, uh, there was a third one that I like to remove. Burn drive, shields. Maybe it's peak performance time and combat readiness. But it's definitely um, degraded drive field and then the one that affects your shields, which I can't remember. Um, those two I definitely recommend you fix every time. Um, other than that, you can leave whatever demod you want behind. Oh, ill advised modifications. Ill advised modifications is a special demod that Ludic Path ships start with. Um, you have to restore that that demod. It's it's not negotiable. Your ship won't function if you have that demod on it. Um, but those are the only three demods that I deem absolutely necessary to restore. The rest you can just leave, and it's not going to affect the quality of your ships. Um, so to save like a couple, you know, maybe like a million credits over the course of like a cycle. Or whatever that's not that impressive um industri industrial planning is going to be every month which is important um this saving you a few million uh probably like two million credits to be honest over the course of like two cycles not not really that not really worth you know six or no i think it's seven No, I think it's six skill points in order to get this, and it's it's just not worth it, in my opinion. Anyway, and then finally we have derelict operations. I, I never take this this skill. Um, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what it does. I know it reduces the amount of um, it reduces the amount of deploy points a ship costs based on how many demons it has uh, which is okay uh, that means you start the fight with more ships so you can roll an entire junkyard fleet which is really cool and then I think it has another ability regarding demods maybe something like that I don't remember I don't remember what the secondary ability does but I never take this skill um, I've never been interested in running a junkyard fleet. I might do it for like roleplay purposes, maybe in another let's play. Um, but for me, mostly my ships are clean anyway because I just spend the credits to restore them. Um, oh, you know what? I'm gonna put hull restoration in C tier. Actually, I remember the second ability of hull restoration is uh, if you lose your ships, you're less likely to lose them permanently in battle. Um, you can recover them usually uh for no story point cost so for that it is it's worth c tier at least but anyway this is the tier list um let me know what you guys think uh any last minute changes that i want to make you know what? i'm gonna put automated ships higher up i can't put it above support doctrine support doctrine is just too good i'm gonna put salvaging a little lower Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to put uh, industrial planning in A tier. Anyway, this is my tier list. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, that was fun to put together. Um, let me know what you think in the comments below. If you agree, disagree, um, would make any changes. Definitely, definitely, definitely let me know. Um, other than that, grumpy out. And now I'd like to give a massive thank you to my supporters. Randall Porter, Zoni, Wet Noodle, and our newest member, Kriltik. Thank you so much. It means a lot that you're willing to support the channel. And if you would like to support the channel as well, feel free to join. Um, it would be the most direct way to support me. 
but do not feel obligated. Uh, again, I won't run ads on this channel. I will continue to provide free content, but um, it just does mean a lot if you are willing to contribute to the channel's success. Other than that, grumpy out.